to worship God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us take this time to really look at his face, behold his face. The Bible encourages us that when we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And that's a wonderful promise. Furthermore, we're told to cast all our cares upon him, for he cares for us. Let's do that now. Let's sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Welcome to Canterbury Baptist Church, online no less. It's really good to see you here, and it's really good to be a part of this service. My name is Raymond Hu, I'm a deacon here, and I'm also a father. And that qualifies me to lead this service because it's Father's Day. To all the fathers out there, happy Father's Day, and God bless you. May you know how blessed you are and how wonderful you are and how important you are. Fathers make a really important contribution to the family and Jesus told us an amazing revelation that God is our heavenly father and I'm hoping that this Father's Day that will really 
enrich and bless your heart this day. Just a little bit about how the order of service will go today. In a moment, we're going to hear from Claire, who will do the Bible reading. Then Joy will present godly play in her most unique and wonderful way. And then we'll hear from Steve, who will deliver the sermon and we'll have a chance to respond. Hi, I'm Claire. I'll be reading Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hi, Pastor Joy here with our Godly Play Space. Last week, we spent our whole time praying. It was a very special time. And I'm really grateful that it was a time for all of us to pray together, including our children. So some of them were using this sheet to help them as we prayed at the fence. So they too did. And many of them wrote in these prayers that we were praying or drew pictures. So that was really good to see. And on the screen now, you'll be able to see some of our children who are um, praying at the fence. They came down on their walk, they brought ribbons, they tied them on and they prayed with us. Okay, now this week we're back into Philippians and I have sent you a couple of files. You will need to download this one, a worry bird. Did you know there was such a thing? <laughs> and a dove. When you make those up following the instructions, your dove should look something like this. And the worry bird will come and look like this, a little bit more fidgety. Now, we all know that birds need a nest. So you might like to make a nest out of Play-Doh or plasticine or maybe even some dry grass, like birds do. We'll need these later. Now we'll get ready for what Paul has to say to us from Philippians. Paul has traveled to many places. He has spoken with many people all about what Jesus said and did. And he saw many churches grow here and here and even all the way over here in Rome. During his travels, he saw a church in Philippi grow too. We've got to know this church really well. We know it began with a lady called Lydia, a servant girl, even a jailer. We know that others joined them. like Caesagus and Euodia and Cis oh, Syntyche. That's right, it's hard to remember, isn't it? That's okay. We don't usually call people those names these days. And Clement, you might meet a Clement. These people were really special to Paul. And Paul was still over here in Rome in jail. And he missed his friends in Philippi very much. And he wrote to them this letter. Dear friends, 
Do not worry about anything. Anything? Paul, how could you say that? There is so much to worry about. When we are attacked and beaten, so much to worry about when we are put in jail. So much to worry about when problems rise up amongst us. How can you say, don't worry? Yet Paul said, instead of worrying, pray about everything. Everything. Remember, said Paul, God is with you. Remember, God is love. God is light. And God is spirit. Then, knowing this, instead of being like a worry bird, that can't get comfortable in its nest and tosses and turns and fidgets and fusses. Instead, you will know peace like a strong, sturdy dove. Peace that keeps your mind and your hearts safe. Even when outside is unsafe. I wonder how the Philippian church felt when Paul said, don't worry about anything when there was so much to worry about. What was it like, I wonder, to know that God was with them? I wonder what upsets your mind and your heart. And I wonder where you are in the story. Thank you to Pastor Joy. Thank you to Claire for the Bible reading. Thank you to Ray for guiding us through the service so well, to our music team, and also for Nathan. Nathan Robb, who is unseen, but nonetheless is working very hard behind the scenes in recording and editing our service. Thank you for the wonderful team that we have and how you guys come together to lead us through this worship service. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here at Canterbury Baptist Church, and it is now my privilege just to uh, take us into this time where we're going to reflect a bit more on our reading for today. And we are, are going to continue our, our journey through Philippians uh, and uh, a Bible reading today in Philippians chapter 4. And the title for this sermon, and the title is almost, if you will, the punchline. It's almost the, the, the main point or the main direction. So it's almost like, uh, like giving you the ultimate spoiler. It's, uh, it's, it's telling you exactly where this sermon is going to end, even before it begins. Uh, but the title of this sermon is, Let Worry Lead Us to Prayer. Paul starts our reading today with uh, four words. Uh, but these are four uh, challenging words to hear. As a matter of fact, as I read them, I'd like you to hear those words, but I'd also like you to hear your own response to those words. Where does your mind go? What does your heart feel the moment you hear these words being said? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul starts by saying, Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything anything. 
Uh, that sounds like um, an impossible command. As a matter of fact, almost worse than that, it sounds like an irrational command. Uh, in, the Greek, in the Greek, it is in fact a command. Uh, in, it is in the, um, in the imperative mood. So in other words, it's actually, uh, it's not just a statement of fact or passing on information. This is, this is Paul turning to this congregation and with the firmest voice he could possibly say, he says to them, don't worry about anything. This is a statement he wants not just for them to hear, but he wants for them to feel. He wants for them to, to, to process right down into the very depths of their spirit. There is something very significant and very important about these four words. Um, but you can imagine being in the church of Philippi, in Philippi, hearing these four words, and you can imagine that they would always want to shoot straight back at Paul in response to them with a whole series of, yeah, 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 but what about... Right? Yeah, yeah, I hear you saying don't worry about anything, but, 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 but what, about, what about our lack of money or, or our lack of resources or our lack of people or the lack of respect that we get from the community around us or the lack of honor that, that we are held in in a culture that is all about honor? For us to be dishonorable is, uh, is, 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 uh, is a terribly shameful thing for us within this community. Or, or, or Paul, what about the attacks that we are experiencing from our neighbors? Or, or, or Paul, what about the very fact that you are in jail facing execution, that the, our leaders are in jail? Come on, Paul, what do you mean don't worry about anything? That's surely impossible. What about all of these circumstances that we are in right now? And you can imagine that for the people in the early church there, it's not too big a step to then see all of those circumstances, all of those struggles, all of those things which could give them uh, reason to worry. And for them in their imagination, in their mind, to begin to take what they would feel to be very rational and logical steps. You know what? Oh, well, we haven't, got, we haven't got money, we haven't got respect, we haven't got honor, and our leaders are in jail, and this is, this is going wrong, and this, that's going wrong, and we're beginning to suffer some persecution. Uh, it's, it's, it, tell you what, the only way I can see that this is going to end, this is just going to end badly for all of us. You know, I, I, I can't see any other way that we could possibly imagine a future for ourselves in which we even have a future. You know, surely the end of this road, the only logical conclusion we can take in this moment of history that we are in is everything is gonna end badly. You know what? It was nice while it lasted. Nice to hang out with you guys. Nice to at least believe in Jesus for a while and at least have our hope that Jesus and the kingdom of God might be coming to build a better world around us. But you know what? As far as I can see, there is no hope. There is no future for the church. Any sane and rational person can see that, 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 that we've tried our best, but you know what? It's time for us just to move on and move past all this. And the only rational thing we can do maybe is to lie awake at night, thinking about and trying to process and trying to understand all of the complexity of the situ situation that we are in, uh, and, and finally maybe just being able to hope that we are left alone so that we can live out our days in peace and quiet. And then Paul comes to them and says, don't worry about anything. When you hear Paul say those words, what was the thought that went into your brain? What was the reaction that you experienced in your own heart? I'm actually going to leave about 20 or 30 seconds of silence right here in the middle of a sermon, because I want you to actually push past the voice of me preaching, and I want you to actually reflect on what your reaction is. When you hear the words, don't worry about anything, what is it that immediately in your brain you say, yeah, 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 but what about dot, dot, dot? How is it that you finish that sentence? Don't worry about anything, yeah, 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 but what about, let me give you 20 seconds, and I want you to actually crystallize and form those images and thoughts in your own mind. I'm sure every thought that you've had, every response that you've had, every yeah, what about, yeah, but what about response that you would have to this instruction not to worry is reasonable, is quite rational. If you and I had the opportunity to sit down and you were to lay out the circumstances of your life or maybe even lay out the circumstances of the world in which we live, 
Um, we, could, we could quite easily find lots and lots of reasons why worry would be the only reasonable and rational response to the circumstances of the world in which, we're, which we are in. And actually, that's a really important point for us to make and for, you, and for us all to hear. Worry is a very natural and a very human response. It's a response to the experience of, experience of living in a world that has got, if you will, almost too big for us. We look around us and it feels like the world has become so big and so crazy and so complicated that there is no way that we can possibly see a path to navigate through the complexities of the world in which we, in, which we are in. So we look around looking for a path, looking for a way through, looking for you know, some sort of light of hope on the horizon that gives us a sense of direction and movement forward through all of these circumstances and we can't see it. And in that moment, it's actually very natural and it's by no means wrong to start to worry, to start to fret, to even start to feel that sense of wanting to, wanting to, to, just, to uh, j- just to pull yourself into a smaller world and hold yourself in a tighter place in the midst of a large and complex set of circumstances that we are in. Now, worrying is perfectly normal. It's, it's a part of life. And Paul does not judge them. He never judges them for their worry. He doesn't say to them that they are bad people for worrying and for troubling about the real and difficult situations that they are facing in life. But what Paul wants to do is he wants to reposition worry in their own mind, in their own heart, and in their own experience. He doesn't want worry to be that thing that dominates that controls them, that, that, uh, that causes them to, uh, that, that, that their lives end up be, uh, becoming about their worry. Instead, what he wants is for that worry to be like a trigger. And he wants them to see in that experience of worry an opportunity to direct their worry into a bigger place, into a God place, into a more hopeful place. Paul continues his thought in verse 6, where he says, Instead, pray about everything. Can you hear the uh, the contrast in those two phrases? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. This is an invitation into a life of prayer, and not just a life of prayer in which we just pick up maybe a couple of things that we think are most important to us and we might lift them up in prayer. But this is an invitation into a life of prayer, a life in which we are conscious of God's presence around us and conscious that in each and every circumstance of life, God is wanting to listen to us. God is bending his ear down to us to hear us. And he is interested and and desiring that we lift up everything. So as we walk into a circumstance of life in which maybe there is a challenge that we're facing, to be to in that moment to say, hey, God, help me with this challenge. Maybe there is a moment in which we're feeling particularly happy or there is a reward or there is some sort of moment of celebration or a good thing that takes place. And in that moment, we can say, hey, God, thank you for this. This is wonderful. That, that moment where in all circumstances of life, we lift all things up to the Lord in prayer. This is, as I said, an invitation into a life of prayer, but but this is not a judgment against worry. What this is by Paul is some instruction on how to begin to redirect our worry in a direction that brings us to a place in which we have more hope and a bigger vision of the world in which the overwhelming sense that worry can build in our life is able to be harnessed and corralled and directed so that we can actually see that even that no matter how big the circumstances may be around us, that in fact we look to and see a God who is even bigger than that. And no matter how confused the road or the map may look before our eyes, we look to a God who does in fact shine the light of his grace and shine the light of his spirit are out there in the world and we can catch that light in our eyes and begin to walk in that direction knowing that by doing that we are walking on the path that God has for us. The life of prayer redirects our worry, redirects the energy of our concern and our worry into, uh, into a path in which we can have a sense of a future and a hope and momentum and growth and life. It's interesting that as Paul talks about prayer, uh, he speaks about it in two particular senses. So continuing at verse 6, he says, tell God what you need. That's the first one. Tell God what you need. And then the second is, 
and thank him for all he has done. Tell God what you need. Prayer can, prayer can be an expression in which we tell God what we need. Um, that's not bad or wrong to lift up your needs to God in prayer and to be very specific about it. Not to be sort of vague, but to pray, hey, God, uh, give, give me my daily bread is not an unscriptural prayer at all. As a matter of fact, that's from the Lord's Prayer. That's from the, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. To be, to be specific in our prayers about our needs is an important part of praying to God, not being vague, but being specific and even detailed. But we can be fearful. Uh, we can be hesitant about being too specific in our prayers because I think sometimes what we fear is failure. Um, what if God doesn't answer? What if I lift up my specific needs? What if I lift up my specific worries? What if I lift up my specific concerns in this moment and the next day those worries and concerns are still there? Doesn't that mean that God has failed? And so surely I don't want to, in my prayers, set God up to fail. So maybe I should just be more vague in my prayers so that God can also be more vague in his answers and we can both continue to live in a vague, prayerful relationship with each other. But actually what, what, uh, what Paul is encouraging the church there in Philippi is don't be shy. Don't be vague. Uh, lift up those needs that you have. Tell God what you need. Make your requests known to him. Make your prayers specific. But then here's the key bit. Then trust. Have faith. Um, not the kind of, not faith that God will do what you've told him to do. Our faith is not based upon, hey God, I'm going to tell you what my needs are and you're going to, you're going to respond to my prayers the way I want you to. That's, that's not the relationship that God sets up through prayer. So our faith is not that God is going to do as we have, as we have told him to do. But our faith is instead in the character of God. That as we tell God what we need, like a child going to their parent, expressing to the parent what the child uh, believes that they need, our belief in God as we do that is that God is good. It's that God hears our prayers and wants to hear our prayers. It's that God's spirit is moving in the world around us and it's that God desires all people to be saved. And so that through prayer, what we are doing is we are, we are putting our requests and putting our needs before God is that we are putting ourselves in, in, into God's world. Uh, it's, prayer is a way then in which we can live in a, in a world with an awareness that God is around us. If we are not in the habit of prayer, if prayer is something that we might do once a week as part of an online church service or something that's very occasional to us. One of the fruits of a lack of prayer is, an, is a lack of awareness that God is with us at all times. One of the wonderful fruits of a, of, of a consistent life of prayer, yes, even those short, snappy little prayers you might say, we just quietly say to yourself, thank you, God, for this, or God, please help me as I, as, I, as, as I go into this place. Those quick, short, little snappy prayers. But one of the fruits of a life of prayer is that prayer increases our awareness of God around us. And so as we become more aware that God is around us, yes, even as we are in a state where we lift up our needs to him, there is also that sense in which everything else, uh, everything else uh, is then seen through the light of God being with us at all times. And even, though, even those things that rightly would cause us to worry, even those experiences of life that rightly would bring us great concern, even as we walk through those seasons of worry and concern, our prayerfulness to God, our willingness to lift up our needs to God and to trust in God's goodness, to trust in his character, these are the things that give us the vision that there is something even beyond our worry. There is something even beyond those things in our life that rightly would give us concern. Uh, but the second half of that is, to say, is Paul also says, not, don't just uh, tell God what you need, but also thank him for what he has done. Uh, gratefulness, an attitude of thankfulness and gratefulness is a wonderful way of redirecting our energies. I was having a conversation with someone a few weeks back and they told me, uh, they, they told me something that they do, which I'd, I'd never heard from anyone else before. And what they said was this, every time they sit down online to pay their utility bill, so like their electricity bill, they get their electricity bill and then they sit down online in front of the computer and they transfer money from their bank account into the electricity company's bank account as a way of paying their bill. Every time they pay that, that, they pay that bill, they always say thank you. 
I found that kind of odd. I don't think I've ever said thank you while I'm in the process of paying a bill. It's just not the way that my mind has worked in the past. Um, but, but for them, what they did was they weren't just looking at the, the dollar amount on the bill and then how much fewer dollars they're going to have in their bank account by paying that bill. They had the, the mind frame of gratefulness. They had the headspace of gratefulness. And even as they paid that bill, and yes, that money was transferred out of their bank account, there was a real loss, a real world loss that took place there. What they were also able to see was the wonderful blessings and advantages that having electricity had brought into their life. Uh, and they were grateful that they had electricity. They were grateful for all, all the ways that electricity was able to improve the quality of their life. And uh, even as they, they experienced the loss of their finances that, uh, in the area of paying the bill, they were able to focus gratefully on the blessings of what the, of what the electricity had, uh, had given to them. An experience of worry is an experience of constantly seeing what could be or might be, or things that we are concerned about. It's looking around through the ideas of what could be or might be. And what happens is we end up living in a very unsettled place. We end up sort of being, at least mentally, being quite fidgety and distracted and unfocused. And the, the more worry we have, the, more, the less we're able to rest and the less we're able to focus. But Thanksgiving is that wonderful experience. Giving thanks to God is that wonderful experience in actually paying attention to what you already have. Not looking at what you might want or not looking at what you don't have or not looking at what other people have that you don't have. But a heart of gratefulness is to look at what you actually already have and to say, hey, thank you, God. I, I see what I have. I see the blessings you've given me. I see the gifts that you've poured into my life. I see the advantages that you've brought to me. Thank you. And as we have a heart of gratefulness, a heart that can give, give and bring thanks to God, then our energy that might otherwise be taken up with worry has a chance of being redirected into a place in which we're able to lift our eyes beyond that small place that our worry wants to, 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 to contain us within and see the wonderful work and goodness of God all around us. Paul finishes the reading today in verse 7 where he says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand his peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. I love that exceeds anything we can understand. If we are a people who can lift up our needs to God and can also bring thankfulness to God, uh, see through the eyes of gratefulness and thankfulness all that God has already given us, then the fruit in verse 7 is that we will experience God's peace, but a peace that exceeds anything that we can understand. The peace that comes as we, as we lift up our hearts in prayer to God, as we lift up our needs and we offer our thankfulness to God, is a peace that no amount of our own efforts and grim determination and gritting of teeth and trying to work our way through the problems and trying to focus on all the different ways that our minds might be trying to, 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 to get us to think through the problems, no amount of that human effort is ever going to produce the fruit of peace. That simply being able to learn how to rest and trust in God is able to bring into our life. As a matter of fact, my experience both in my own life but also as a pastor to people is the more we focus on those issues, the more we focus on those things that bring us worry, the more we spend our nights just ruminating over them and trying to strategize around them and making plans of, of how we think that we're going to deal with them. Actually, the smaller our world becomes, the higher our worry becomes, the less restful we become, the less grateful we become, the more distracted we become. But to be able to find that wonderful place of prayer, that wonderful place of redirecting that worry energy into a prayer energy and learning how to trust God, to lift up our needs and offer thanks to God in prayer and have worry as a trigger that directs us into prayer then actually the, 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 the more we are opening ourselves up to the possibility of receiving this incredible gift of peace, a peace that comes from talking with God, a peace that comes from developing and deepening relationship with God, a peace that, uh, that actually results in a healthier mind, a healthier heart and a healthier spirit, even in seasons of life that are genuinely challenging. And that the, the second half of verse 7 says that this peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. This peace will guard us. This peace will protect us. 
I've made the comment a few times that the city of Philippi was a, was a, a city that was designated to be Italian Roman soil there in a, in a Macedonian region. It was, and it was an army town. It was a garrison town. It had walls around it and soldiers that marched around the walls. And so you can imagine that the image of a safe place, a safe country, a guarded plot of land, a place where if you're feeling threatened, you can run into the city of Philippi and the Roman army and the Roman guards and the Roman walls and the Roman engineering and the Roman stratagems are all there to guard you when you are are within the walls of that city. And so Paul's sort of picking up that, that idea or that experience from their ordinary life and he's saying to them, you know what, the peace of God has the same experience. When you can run into the experience of prayer, of prayer to God, run into the experience of trusting God, trusting God's goodness, run into the experience of receiving the fruits of that prayer in receiving the peace of God, then that peace of God will guard your heart. It will guard your heart and it will guard your mind. As I'm sure we've all experienced in different ways, a loss of peace can be devastating to our mental condition and to our emotional resilience. Uh, But finding peace can be incredibly stabilizing, even in the middle of a tumultuous and challenging time. Those experiences of worry in our life uh, reflect in us something of the wrestle that takes place in all of our lives. There is that wrestle between our human nature, that the very human part of us that of course can only see life from our point of view, that of course can only experience life through, through our five senses, that of course can only look at the, at the possibilities for the future within the framework and the level of understanding that we have. And so of course, we're gonna see many things and experience many things that we, that we find to be overwhelming. Uh, and, and we're gonna be facing many situations in life that are certainly far bigger than us. And the instinct to worry in those, in those circumstances, of course, is very natural. But at the same time, as people who have committed our lives to be followers of Jesus, we do also hear in the words of Jesus a, a, an eternal perspective, a biggest perspective. We have hope in the God who is above and beyond all things, who works all, ting, all things together for our good and for his glory. And we also hear in, uh, in, for example, the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 12, where he says to his disciples, I tell you, do not worry about your everyday life, whether you will have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. And so we're hearing even the words of Jesus, this that challenge, uh, challenge that, that our life is to be framed around a vision of life that is bigger than what our, that, that the needs and the desires that we experience in life will ever allow our lives to be. I've wrestled a bit with how to finish this sermon. Um, at one level, if I just want to keep it at a spiritual level, I can, I can end it here and, uh, and you can take this away as a spiritual lesson. But I've been somewhat prompted to maybe just dig a little bit deeper and maybe just to open up something of my own life and experience in a couple of, of areas as a way of just prompting and, and maybe provoking each of us to think through this issue a little bit more deeply. You see, the call upon all of us or the experience of worry in all of our life is that worry uh, puts us in a box in which our experience of life becomes then more limited. Uh, When we see ourselves in life through the category of, uh, well, I guess through our own eyes, through the category of our own comforts and our wants and our plans and our desires, and we can struggle in those times when our plans and our desires and our wants and our comforts are being disrupted, we can struggle to see the bigger picture of God's plan and God's purpose for us. The question of God, where are you in this moment can be a question that's very hard to answer. And if you are in that moment, as, as each of us do experience on a fairly regular basis, um, the encouragement that Paul has given us is to cry out in prayer, to, to, to lift up prayers where you tell God your needs and you also give thanks to God. And, but that's not a quick fix. It's not like you can be in a moment of worry and then suddenly just go, oh, okay, okay God, I'll just, I'll just pray to you right now. And because I'm praying to you right now, you're going to make all that worry disappear. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, there's more of a disciplined life. There is more of a life that uh, God is calling us into in which we are people who learn what it is to live in the presence of God and live in, a, in, a, in such a way as we live beyond ourselves. And we do this on a regular weekly basis so that when we hit these harder moments of life, we are already in the discipline and the pattern of doing that. Let me make that practical for you. 
Um, when, uh, when children are growing up, probably the, the, the first three you know, basic life skills that, that many children learn is they learn how to walk, they learn how to count, and they learn how to, to write their letters. And these three skills, the walking and the counting and the, the writing of their letters, are skills that are then developed and built on throughout the rest of their life. And, uh, and, but, if, but without these three basic skills, then learning, learning other things from there becomes a whole lot harder. Well, there's kind of three basic disciplines, three basic skills that anyone who is a follower of Jesus that is challenged even by Jesus to learn and develop in their life. And these are the skills that are found in the Sermon on the Mount, the skills of praying, the skills of giving, and the skill of fasting. And, and each of those skills is an experience in which we sacrifice something of ourselves to enter into something that is bigger than ourselves. That's the direction that each of them take us in. We sacrifice something of ourselves, of our comforts, of our money, of our time. But the trade-off is that by sacrificing something of ourselves, we end up bringing ourselves further into a world that is bigger than ourselves. And by doing it in small, disciplined ways on a regular basis, it then makes it easier easier in those moments of great stress and great worry and great trial to be able to see beyond ourselves and enter into a bigger world when there's even more pressure upon us. And so each of those disciplines, I'm just going to take them one by one. So giving, the basic principle in the Bible is the, give, is the, the principle of tithing, which is you look at your income and immediately the, the first 10% of that is not for you. That's the vision. It's not for you. It's to be given away by you to the work of the Lord, to missions or to other purposes. But it's not to be used for our own purposes. So it's, uh, and, so, and so the discipline is, is that as we look at our budget, as we look at our finances, we have already pre-allocated that the first 10% is not for our use whatsoever. And so as we look at our, our grocery budget, our entertainment budget, even uh, as we look at potential investments or potential uh, debts and, uh, and repayments on debts, we ourselves already know that 10 10% of our income is not to be allocated towards any of those things. Uh, that there is a discipline that we are each called into, not to see even the financial resources that we have as being 100% mine, it's mine, all mine, and I will do with it what I please. But actually to say, no, give up 10%. And the challenge here is if we don't have the faith to give up 10% of the income that we earn, of the resources that we have been, been provided, if giving up 10% of that is too much for us, that we're not really learning to have the faith to be able to trust God for much bigger and much more challenging uh, moments in our life. Uh, in the area of fasting, and this is an area where I'm actually going to be op open with you a little bit about, about, about some of the ways that, that I manage this within my own life. And it's not because I'm trying to present myself as someone who's got it all together or super spiritual. As a matter of fact, I'm deeply aware of my frailty and my humanity. And it's actually having these disciplines in my life is so important on keep, in keeping me on track. If I didn't have the disciplines, I would so easily drift into worry or drift into other areas that are not healthy for me as a person or healthy for me in my relationship with God. So even as I'm, I, I talk about this, it's not pumping my own tire, I tires up. I genuinely want to engage with you as a congregation in some of these disciplines and considering how these might be applied into your life. And I know for me personally, part of my process of working through how I lived these out was actually hearing how other people did it and sort of stealing some of their ideas and being inspired by some of the ways they thought through these processes. So let me just op open up to you fasting. Um, so for me, um, a, 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 a weekly practice of fasting for me is that I skip lunch twice a week. And for me, that's a bit of a sacrifice. I, I, don't, I don't enjoy skipping meals. So skipping, skipping a meal is a bigger deal. I know for other people, it's not so much. But for, but for me, particularly when I was starting off, it, it was a bigger deal. Uh, I skip lunch twice a week. And the way that I do that is I, I get up in the morning and I have breakfast as normal, a normal breakfast at a normal time. And then from the time I finish breakfast until the time we sit down as a family for the evening meal, I just won't eat anything. I'll make sure I have, have plenty of fluids. Uh, and, and I do that twice a week. And once again, that's just a discipline or a rhythm in my life. Uh, it's interesting, if you go for 10 or 11 hours during the day without food, and I'm, I don't have any underlying medical conditions or anything that, that would make that more complicated for me. Certainly, if you have an underlying medical condition or other considerations, you, that, you, that this may not be the right, right kind of fast for you to look at. Uh, but for me, as you go through 10 or 11 hours through your day without food, 
um, you, you feel that pinch in your belly or you feel the temptation as you walk into the house just to grab a quick snack on the way through. And the discipline of being able to say no to yourself, no to your desires, no to that, 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 uh, that pinch or that, that, that mild pain within you, that desire that wants to be satisfied. And the discipline of being able to say no to yourself in the small area of skipping one meal, right? this is not earth shattering stuff, um, actually lays the foundation for the discipline to be able to say no to much bigger and sometimes much more painful but much more important decisions in life. I have a friend of mine for whom skipping a meal is not a sensible thing for her to do. And so the way she fasts is she actually fasts from social media. So she takes her phone, she turns uh, internet off her phone. So that makes it a smartphone in, phone into a dumb phone. So a phone that can still take and receive telephone calls and text messages, but it can't, can't do anything on the internet. And she gives herself all of Sunday away from social media. And for her, there's a bit of a sacrifice in that. She, she enjoys being on social media. There's a bit of a pinch, a bit of a pain in that, um, almost a, a sense sometimes of loss or missing out. But for her, that discipline of saying no to herself on this regular basis is an incredibly important spiritual discipline. And it's something that each one of us, it's, it's a basic foundational discipline. If we are not already in the rhythm and the habit of fasting, whatever that particularly means for us, then it becomes much harder to grow from that into, into areas which are far more complicated, but actually become far more, uh, far more important and critical for us to be able to find faith in God in these other moments, found, uh, both giving and fasting are foundations that we can build up from. Um, the, the third discipline is prayer, and I confess this is actually the one I struggled with the most. I, I would often find that uh, if I had a prayer time, I found it hard to keep to it. And I also found that my prayers got very repetitive. I just sort of had this list of prayers, and I found myself sort of praying them over and over again every day. And I just found that particularly uninspiring. Uh, and so for me, the way that a disciplined life of prayer has been able to work is uh, I've actually gone and started praying other people's prayers. So for me, I, I have a prayer book. Uh, so I use this book, it's called Common Prayer, a, a, a liturgy for ordinary radicals. There you go. Um, and it's a great little book. It has a prayer for each day uh, in it. And what, what the authors have done is taken prayers from all different Christian traditions. Uh, these are ancient prayers and modern prayers and they're, and they're knit together on a day by day basis. And they, are, they give you a structure and a framework of prayer. And the way that, that I do this is I actually do this with my wife. So Ruth and I do this and the way it works in our life is it's literally the last thing that we do each night. Um, so we sit down and we just read through the prayer. The prayer is generally one page, so it's not super long. Uh, and you can read through it quickly if you're feeling a bit tired and pressed for time. Um, uh, but we read through that. And what we commit ourselves is that this time of prayer, it might be five minutes or six or seven minutes, depending on how, on how long you take. And there is time in each prayer for you to actually pray your own prayers out loud. So you're not just reading someone else's prayer. There is a spot in there where, where Ruth and I can pray for each other and pray for our kids and pray for the church and our community. Uh, so there is opportunity to bring your own prayers into that space. But, but what we've found in our life together is having a structure, having prayers that are written for us, uh, and then setting aside a time every single day. And here's the catch, prioritizing the time. What we have agreed within ourselves or among ourselves is it doesn't matter what time we end up crawling into bed. It doesn't matter what else has gone on in the day. The one thing we will not skip is praying together. And yes, that sometimes means if we've had a particularly big day that we might be going to bed after midnight and yet, before we go to sleep, we still, we still sit down for five or six minutes and we read through the prayers. And that, just, that little discipline of prayer is once again just a small practice that gets our spirit and our mind in a place in which we can see beyond ourselves and begin to learn how to see the bigger work of what God is doing all around us. So may we be a people who learn what it is not to be caught up in all the many very good reasons we have to worry, but may worry for us become a trigger to draw us more deeply into the presence of God and may in specific ways, can I challenge you to think about what it means for you to learn those basic skills of walking, drawing and counting, you know, the basic skills of giving, fasting and prayer, what it might look for you to begin to develop those instincts and habits and rhythms in your life so that God will take those things and develop them into deeper levels of faith in him. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word.
And now we come to the time of the offering. Please find below the offering details. I know this is a difficult time for many people within our church and also outside. And if this is you, please take this gift of our service with no obligation. But if you can contribute, we, we deeply appreciate the generosity of this church and how this church understands that giving is an act of worship and that it is better to give than to receive. And now we come to a time of prayer. Father, we want to pray for fathers this day. We pray that you will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children back to their fathers and that this reconciliation work will be an amazing thing to behold. Father, we also want to pray for those who don't have fathers. May you comfort them in the way that only the Almighty God can. We pray for our church to fulfill the mission of God, to be the kind of church that understands how to be the hands and feet of the body of Christ. We pray that our church will know how to love those who are deemed unlovely, how to be gracious to those who may be forgotten. We pray for our hearts to expand that even though our world has shrunk, our hearts won't. May we always love our neighbour and understand what that means. God, we are so excited about our future. We're thankful for the pastors we have here and all the volunteers and the wonderful property search team, property development team. Thank you for the energy and the vision that they have. Bless them as they use all their skills to honour you. God, we pray for our community, for those around us whom we know are suffering such anxiety and fears. God, may you comfort them, may you inspire them with hope, the hope that comes from understanding your grace that you give us unmerited favour, not what we deserve, but even what we don't deserve. May that sense of hope rise up in the world around us. Father, as we pray for our world, for world leaders, we pray for wisdom for them. We pray for an attitude of listening. We pray that there will be real understanding between people who feel that there's no possibility or resolution. And now we just want to give space to remember and to pray for those whom you have on our hearts. Those that maybe are hurting, those who may not be remembered by anyone else. We take that time now to pray for them. Thank you, God, for being a father to all. May your name be exalted forever. Amen.
Thank you for being a part of this service. And thank you to Pastor Steve for the wonderful sermon. If there's anything that you've heard during the service that has touched you in some way, or if there's anything further you'd like to explore, or if you have a need, please get in contact with Pastor Steve on the email below. And now it is my privilege to give the benediction. So go, the people of God who have freely received, now go into the world and freely give as you have received. And may the peace of God guard and protect your hearts. May you know this peace and share it with others. Go in peace.